Okay, go ahead. Hello. Welcome to the Gardena Valley Japanese Cultural Institute, Day of Remembrance 2021. My name is Alvin Takamori. I'm a GVJCI board member and a GVJCI Day of Remembrance committee member. Um, in case you're wondering, uh, my virtual backdrop here is a scene of Manzanar. Uh, in a normal year, the GVJCI would have a bus headed up to uh, the Manzanar pilgrimage at the end of April. But uh, this year, you won't need the bus. Uh, the Manzanar pilgrimage, uh, just like this program, will be online. I'm starting off, I want to first of all thank the, uh, the um, George and Sakaya Aratani uh, Community Advancement Research uh, Endowment and the UCLA Asian American Study Center for co-sponsoring this uh, program. I also want to thank Donald Inadomi for his steadfast support of this program. And I want to thank all of the uh, community supporters who have agreed to help promote this program. And of course, I want to thank all of you for uh, being here and watching today. Uh, fortunately, last year, we were able to have this program before uh, COVID-19 changed everything. And uh, we're hoping that uh, by this time next year, uh, we can go back to seeing everyone in person. Uh, with me on this, uh, uh, I guess, video conference are uh, fellow uh, Day of Remembrance Committee members, uh, Taylor Week. Uh, Taylor, you wanna give a wave? And Eileen Yoshimura. And then uh, in the background, uh, we've got um, Michelle Hirano and Stephanie Maeda, our program manager, who are helping us out. Uh, our special guests today are from the Densho Kampu podcast, Hana and Noah Maruyama, and from the California State University Japanese American Digitization Project, we have Greg Williams and Jennifer Hill. And we'll be seeing a lot more of everyone uh, shortly. Now, uh, the Day of Remembrance uh, commemorates President Roosevelt's signing of Executive Order 9066 back on February 19th, 1942. Now, you may have noticed that every president signs executive orders. Um, president Biden recently signed a whole stack of them upon taking office. And I'm sure most people don't pay a whole lot of attention to them, but maybe we should. Executive Order 9066 uh, had an enormous impact on the Nikkei community even though on its surface, it might not seem like it would have. It granted the US military the authority to create military zones over which they had control and they could do whatever they deemed necessary for national security. As a consequence, they created military zones covering the entire West Coast of the United States and removed anyone of Japanese ancestry from these zones. Their reason for doing this was built on a lie. Now, if you've been paying attention to the news recently, you may notice that when government officials lie, there can be severe consequences. In 1942, the lie was that there were Nikkei who were plotting and committing acts of espionage or sabotage, and that there wasn't time to sort out who the good people were from the bad people. And so they decided to remove the entire community. Of course, today we know that there wasn't a single act of espionage or sabotage. And thanks to the work of researchers like Aiko Herzig Yoshinaga, we have documents proving that the government knowingly lied. This evidence helped lead to the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 and the success of redress and reparations 
and the overturning of the convictions of Fred Korematsu, Gordon Hirabayashi, and Minyasui. Now, if you've been looking at the GBJCI's Day of Remembrance uh, website over this past week, uh, we featured ICO as part of the CSU Japanese American Digitization Project Archives. Uh, one of the things on there is a timeline of her life, and it provides insight into this period of history. Aiko and Lane Hirabayashi, uh, who we unfortunately lost last year, um, he's also featured on our website. Um, Lane and Aiko spoke about the importance of accurate terminology and to avoid the euphemisms that government tends to use to cover up their actions. One of these terms is internment camp. I mean, most people still use that. But if you look at the actual meaning of an internment camp, it's a facility for the mass detention of foreigners. Well, two thirds of the Nikkei who were incarcerated were Americans. So the correct term is a concentration camp, a term even President Roosevelt used in documents. Another term that we should reconsider is alien. Uh, the Biden administration recently advocated uh, replacing the use of alien with the term non-citizen. And I think that's a good thing. If you wanna understand the negative connotation of alien, you can go back to 1942. The government wanted to obscure the fact that they were imprisoning citizens. So they invented a new term and referred to Japanese Americans as non-aliens. Now think about that. What's a non-alien? Well, it's an American. Now, this is how the government uses words to deceive people. We tend to think of history books as factual, but the truth is they are just stories written from the perspective of the writer. And that's why it's so important for us to write our own stories. One of the things um, that our collections on our website um, this, this whole past week have been doing is helping to tell our stories. Collections um, are the reason, you know, the reality is, oh, excuse me, but the reality is that before long, the people who actually lived through the World War II incarceration will no longer be with us. And these collections are helping to preserve their stories. They provide evidence, facts about what really happened to them and to help combat the lies and accurately tell the story of our history for future generations. So let's get to some of those stories. Our first guests, um, I'm going to uh, turn this uh, program over to my fellow uh, Day of Remembrance Committee member, Taylor Week. Thank you, Alvin. Um, hi, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today for Gardena Valley JCI's first virtual Day of Remembrance. My name is Taylor Week. I am a part of the DOR committee, and today I have the honor of interviewing the two co-hosts and producers of Den Show's podcast, Kampu, who just so happen to be siblings, which I love. Um, if you folks haven't been checking our DOR website this week, just wanted to let you all know that we did feature Kampu on Tuesday. So if you have time after today, you can head over and check it out on our website or you can go to Den Show's website uh, to listen to the podcast where there are currently, I think, six episodes out. Um, and before we dive into questions, I just wanna share a little bit more about Hannah and Noah Mariyama, and then they will play a short audio clip. So uh, those of you who haven't listened to Kampu or a podcast before can kind of get a sense of what it's all about. So Hannah Mariyama is a PhD candidate in American studies who formerly worked for the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, American Public Media's Order 9066, and the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center. And Noah Mariyama is a DC-based audio engineer who, with Hannah, co-produces and co-hosts 
Campu, and also serves as a composer and audio engineer for the podcast, which is really cool. Um, so Hannah and Noah, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Um, so I understand you two have an audio clip that you'd uh, like to share before you, um, before we dive into questions. Seiji Tsuji was finally leaving. Not that he really had a place to go. For three years behind barbed wire, Seiji received a train ticket to wherever he wanted, shipping for whatever belongings he had left, and $25. Like most of the people who were leaving, he didn't have much anymore. He'd lost, among other things, the car, the tractor, and the farm where he'd raised four children and buried another. Still, during his last few days at Heart Mountain, he fashioned scrap wood into boxes, packed them with care, hammered them shut. They were so heavy the soldiers could barely lift them onto the truck. It feels like rocks, one of them complained. He was right. When Seiichi's wife asked him why he had packed crates of rocks, he told her he thought they were beautiful. From Densho, I'm Hannah Maruyama, and this is Kampo. Thank you for that. And that's from the first episode, right? It's the first part from the first episode. Yeah. Amazing. Um, and also the, the man that you talk about in the very beginning, Seiji, he is, you mentioned your great grandfather? He is, yeah. He's our dad's mom's father. Um, I'll probably, I'm going to be asking you more questions about that later, um, but just to get started on this, I wanted to say your, your partnership together seems so perfect, what with uh, Hannah, your history background and Noah's work as an audio engineer. So I was curious to know how long this podcast or something like it, how, how, how long has it been in the making and how did you become interested in embarking on something like this together? Uh, I love that question. Um, we have been thinking about doing a podcast together ever since a car ride probably like three years ago at this point and both Noah and I can like remember being in the car together I have no idea where we were going actually do you remember Noah we were there was some section of uh DC where uh we were born and where I live uh that we've never been in before yeah no, anyways no. it wasn't that important it was a car ride but we were chatting about how frustrated i was sometimes working on other people's projects about japanese american incarceration particularly when the projects are being led by non-japanese americans because you know i'd have these ideas and i'd bring them to them and, and at the end of the day they could just be like yeah that's just not the direction we see this going in and so i was like i just really want to create my own podcast and really have a, a voice and be able to like say what I want to say. And there was this book that I had been inspired by, um, Julie Otsuka's Buddha in the Attic, which I highly recommend that everyone read if they haven't already. It's a beautiful novel. Um, but what she does in that is she uses this like first person plural kind of voice to represent the experiences of different picture brides. And um, what I loved about that was that you got this sense of the group experience, but also of the individual experience. And so that was kind of like the premise of what I brought to Noah was you're studying audio engineering, we should make a podcast. And so like three years ago, we we're like, okay, that's a great idea, maybe someday, but we're never going to make it happen. You know, it was like, definitely not something we we're actually thinking we we're going to make happen. But then the pandemic hit. And we we're like, we have some time right now. We've always said we were going to do this. Why not just make it happen? And Densho was interested. So the rest is history, I guess. And it, I think it's interesting that you note that we're uh, a quote unquote perfect pairing. Uh, but uh, but I, I mean, it, it really was not intentional. And like we, we uh, haven't necessarily gotten the chance to uh, intertwine our work um, all that much uh really ever so uh it, it was this interesting experience of getting to delve into our family history which Hannah, Hannah was more familiar with than I was uh but um also of really I don't know uh getting to know each other better and 
um, bringing our expertises together. It's pretty fun working with your little brother, actually. Um, I mean, you know, it's one of those things where I was like, could go really badly um, at the very beginning, um, but it could make Christmas really awkward after the pandemic. But actually, it worked out really, really well. Like, Noah just understands my vision on a wavelength that is amazing and so he turns these ideas that I have in writing into something that you can actually hear and the first time I listened to it I was like he just gets it he gets me he knows what I'm feeling and so that's been really incredible I love it I also I have a little brother who is two years younger than me so when when I discovered the podcast and that a pair of siblings was behind it, I like ran to him and I was like, you know, this is, we need to be on this level. Like you and I need to, we need to do something creative like this. Do Um, it. Everyone (laughs) should work with their siblings. (laughs) Really recommend it. Family (laughs) bonding opportunity. Um, So I know that you mentioned that the first episode was inspired by your great grandfather. So I was wondering if you can kind of go a little bit more into um, how much of this history that you talk about is personal to you two and your family. Um, I think a lot of it is like, even if we're not explicitly talking about our family, I think, you know, their experiences are always kind of in the back of our minds. And I think a lot of the empathy that we bring to the experience is grounded in the fact that, you know, we have seen our grandmother struggle to talk about this our entire lives. We've seen our dad and our aunts kind of struggle with understanding what happened to their mother when she wasn't able to talk about it. Um, And I think, you know, we talk about our family history a fair amount in the podcast as well, because for us, it was really important that the audience understand where we're coming from, you know, that this isn't just some kind of abstract history that we're, you know, telling, this is our family history as well. And that, you know, we have a specific stake in this story and we come at it from a very specific positionality and that positionality isn't you know it's it's both a a pro and it also has its you know specific limitations too like we can't understand everyone's experiences the same way that we necessarily understand our family's experiences and i think being honest about that is so important for people to be able to say wait You know, like one one thing that someone said to us was, um, I'd love to hear more Okinawan histories. And I was like, yes, I want to hear more Okinawan histories too. And I also am not an expert in Okinawan history and I, I, I want to know more about it. But I think, you know, being honest about that is like great. And then they can say, here's how we can contribute to this story as well. Um, I, I think Alvin actually brought this up, uh, we don't really feel that history by nature is objective. Um, And yeah, we were very invested in, I guess the idea of uh, Japanese Americans telling um, our story first off, which uh, many brilliant media um, have done before us, but um, we came at it specifically from Hannah's, uh, public history angle. And, uh, I mean, personally, I, uh, grew up listening to NPR, um, in the back of my mom's car, uh, my, my entire childhood. So we, we had this desire, I guess, to, um, make a, a very professional sounding, uh, more, um, more of a a, a narrative history, I guess. And, um, we, we firmly believed that, um, we should not necessarily be implanted into the story, but that we, uh, should be clear that we are Japanese American. These are our views. We're not objective here. And, um, that's it. Here you go. Here's how our family informs us. Right, right. Um, and the the title of your podcast is Kombu. Can you talk a little bit about how you chose that name and, and what thinking went into that name? That's a good question. I think, so 
the way we came to it was in the first episode, we talk about um, our great grandfather, uh, Seichi, who collected rocks at Heart Mountain. And you kind of heard that in the intro. And one thing that our great uncle had told us was that in camp, that was actually called Kampu no Kuse. And that meant like camp custom or camp tradition. And I think it was kind of a tongue in cheek thing that like pointed to the incarceration humor. But um, I think the way we're thinking about this is like, this podcast is also, and I think Den Show too, is also trying to collect things. It's trying to collect stories. And so maybe that, that collecting continues to happen. Um, I also think that, and we explained this a little bit more in the first episode, that it's about recognizing the importance of the word camp in Japanese American communities, because I think camp has often been, you know, for our dad and our aunt, like a shorthand for like what their parents went through. And they didn't entirely know what that was. They'd just be like, in camp, we did this. In camp, we ate apple butter and we hated it. Um, but I think that word carries so much energy and weight because it's also, you know, it's a way of, you know, not actually saying the word concentration camp. It's also, it points to what Alden was saying earlier that internment camp is actually like a huge euphemism. Um, so we're actually, we're very intentional in the podcast about calling um, these facilities concentration camps, even though the podcast itself is named Kampu, which is in itself kind of like a community-based euphemism, I would say. Um, I think the word kampu itself is also honoring the fact, the ways that the Issei in particular had to kind of navigate language barriers and like you come up with their own terminologies around things so that they could translate the ideas or the words that they were experiencing in their day-to-day -day lives back into Japanese. Our great grandmother never learned how to speak English. She was alive for 103 years and I she lived until I was like 13 years old and you know, we never had a single conversation because I never got to a level where I was familiar enough with Japanese to be able to speak with her and she couldn't really speak English. And so I think it's also about honoring that language barrier that existed for many of us and just speaking about the complexities and nuances that can exist in a single word, I think is kind of like the philosophy that we also are bringing to the podcast as well. Thank you. Uh, I, you know, I kind of spent a uh, few years, you know, working in Little Tokyo and, and kind of, kind of having a, a deep sense of incarceration. But it really wasn't until, um, you know, I kind of read a little bit about Kampu and the name that I, I just didn't know that that was, you know, how people referred to it. Or and and it's really interesting to be able to learn so much um, about how different generations interacted and perceived uh, camp just simply by using that kind of language. Yeah. Um, and in just thinking of my own upbringing as a Japanese American millennial, uh, I personally didn't really learn about incarceration until middle school, I think, when I read Farewell to Manzanar, as I'm sure a lot of people did. Um, my, my story is a little bit more uh, different in that my family's from Hawaii and, and they weren't incarcerated, so I didn't have that personal history to turn back to. So I'm wondering, when did you two learn about incarceration and um, did you grow up learning about it in depth? Um, I think you I, did. Go ahead, Noah. Uh, yeah, I, I think Hannah mentioned recently that, um, I, I mean, not, neither of us remember it super clearly because it was there and present during our entire childhoods, which uh, speaks to being raised by a sansei uh, instead of Nisei uh, and the differences in that generation. But, um, so we're a uh, mixed race. My, uh, our mother's white and our, our dad's Japanese American. And, um, and I, I, interestingly, our mom is an archivist at the Library of Congress. And she, um, she, she was very invested in, um, in, teaching us this history and providing us resources when we we're little kids, just uh, kids books. Um, 
And I think she was actually part of, I guess, the driving force behind that. Um, our, our, our dad uh, later on became very much um, invested in passing on this history and uh, talking with us. But uh, I don't know, I think she got the ball rolling there, so to speak. I think early on, especially, you know, she was making sure that we had kids books. I was just um, thinking about the bracelet, which is this book by Yoshiko Chida that, you know, I read. I mean, it was a picture book. I must have, I must have been like five, six, probably when we were reading it together. Um, so I think we always knew about it. And I think my dad was always like in the background. He was the one who was like collecting the books and making sure we always had copies to farewell to Manzanar and that sort of stuff. But I think my mom was the one who, you know, didn't have that traumatic association and kind of knew how to talk about camp with us in a way that he, I think found more difficult. And so, you know, when I, when I think about reading uh, the bracelet, I think, I usually think it was with her, um, for whatever reason, even though, you know, I think they alternated nights when they read to us. Um, so yeah, I think they were both there, but it was, it was ongoing and it was a process. And, you know, that entire time, our dad was also doing work to get the sites, um, uh, deemed historical landmarks and national parks and that sort of stuff. And so, you know, he was doing that work behind the scenes, but I think it was harder for him to like have that conversation with his own children a little bit. And so our mom was definitely, you know, the librarian in the room being like, here are the books. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to imply anything about my dad. He uh, very much invested a lot of time and effort and a lot of himself to uh, make sure that we were educated about the Japanese American incarceration. Um, but I, I, it does speak very much, I guess, to the Japanese American experience and uh, I guess really the fabric of our experience that uh, our, as far as the descendants of uh, incarcerees, we all have this, um, this trauma uh, caused by the camps and kind of perpetuated by the silence surrounding um, the camps that gets inherited. And I guess that gets a little easier to break through and talk about over generations, but um, that it is still there even in us Yonsei. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know that you folks utilize a lot of Densha's resources, such as the oral histories, uh, to make this podcast. So how much of the podcast is, is taken from the archives? And do you folks, did you folks have to do any original reporting to add to it? Um, and basically, can you just walk me through the steps of creating an episode? It's a long process. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think we, we knew how much work we were signing up for when we were like, we're going to do this. Um, but yeah, so early on, there was, it was, and there was a lot of figuring out of that process too over time because, you know, we started looking at the Den Show archives, kind of knowing what we wanted the first episode to be about. And I was not finding a ton. And I was like, I just know that there's more here. I just don't know why it's not popping up. But being the daughter of a librarian, I had a feeling that it had to do with whether something was actually like how something was searchable. And they, the archivist at Densho did actually explain to me that the um, recordings are, are, searchable through key terms. So you can search for specific topics that the archivists tagged each interview by. But if the archivist didn't think that that topic was significant enough, if this person had like a throwaway sentence in their, um, in the segment that was about collecting rocks, for instance, but the rest of the segment was about something like more significant to them, that part would just not pop up. 
So we ended up actually having to get copies of all of the transcripts and then build a search algorithm, which luckily I have a friend who does computer science and she was able to kind of help me with that. And so we built this algorithm that would just search through all of the Densho transcripts for that content. And it, I mean, when I say search algorithm, I am using the term extremely generously. I am not a computer scientist. What I built does not act like that either. It looks for a very specific term. And if you don't type in that term exactly, and if there were any typos in the transcript, nothing is going to pop up. But it opened up so many options for us. I think we went from having like 15 quotes total to having like 50 pages of quotes to look at. And so that's kind of step number one is to go through the key terms that we want to um, use to guide that episode and then seeing what those, those incarcerees say about it. So in many ways, they're the ones that are structuring the episode. I don't usually know what shape the episode is gonna take until after I've seen what themes come up in the, the key terms. And after that, I draft up the transcript. I kind of do a lot of, I, I pull out a lot of the quotes and draft up the transcript. And then I send it off to Noah and he does his audio magic. So I'll let him explain that to you. Um, so I, I think it's worth saying first off that um, uh, we, we were pretty in insistent from the outset, uh, Hannah especially, that uh, this be guided uh, by these interviews that Densho had in their archives um, and that the voices of the incarcerees were um, really, really um, crucial to understanding the stories. And uh, what Hannah said about throwaway lines, for instance, that's very important um, because often you, you wouldn't get much more than a single sentence out of me say when they were speaking about something they were really uncomfortable with. Um, and that that's uh, not to say anything of the Issei who had a whole other language barrier to uh, deal with. And um, so as, as far as the, the rest of putting the episode together, uh, there's a ton of audio restoration and um, technical stuff that uh, goes into it. Um, uh, just the clips are often recorded directly from cameras and microphones. So it, it's not necessarily great quality uh, audio to begin with, but we restore it, touch it up. Um, I composed uh, several pieces of music that I edit in. Um, uh, we record voiceover. Uh, in because we're recording remotely, uh, that tends to happen in various closets. Um, and uh, after a very, very long process, we edit it all together and it uh, turns out sounding a little something like uh, the clip we played earlier, as well as with a lot of uh, actual incarcerees talking as well. Uh, how long do you think if you were to calculate, how long does it take to produce one episode? Um, a month of us both working pretty much full time. Yeah. Wow. Um, and then I know, you know, I've taken a look at some of your episodes and I kind of, I, I, I try to count how many people you feature because it's just, you know, so many stories you're drawing from. So I'm wondering, can you ballpark like how many, how many people's uh, oral histories did you source from? It's actually, it ranges widely. So in the cameras episode, I think because cameras ended up being a really defining feature of camp, but they were actually pretty rare. You know, they, we see the photos and we often remember the people who took those photos now, but only a few people actually had cameras when they were in camp. So the number of, um, oral histories that we had that actually talked about cameras were was pretty slim. Um, I think we only included like 25 oral histories in that episode, roughly. Um, and so for that one, we actually did a lot of, we did like four, I think, interviews with academics who had done research around cameras in the camps and photography and that sort of stuff. Um, 
But, you know, the last episode, which was on food, you know, everyone remembers food in the camps. It was a defining part of people's experiences. And that first meal, I mean, so many people talked about that first meal in camp. Um, so I think for that one, we had like 90 plus possibly, at least initially, we might have cut it down somewhat just because of time constraints. Um, Noah was such a <laughs> was such a good sport about it because I made him edit all of these different interviews and it takes so much time for him to do that um but yeah so it, it goes from like 90 to 25 <laughs> um yeah in in total I want to say about somewhere between two and 300 uh would be my best guess Probably. um we we there we'll are a lot of at some point yeah, I'm uh, going to do that very soon, actually. Uh, but th there are a, a lot of uh, people who had multiple interviews and who were more willing and able to uh, speak uh, at some length about certain things. So Aiko Herzegi Yoshinaga, for instance, um, is included quite often in several episodes, but... Um, and Frank Amy, um, but but um, we make a point of trying to include Issei uh, when we can. Um, it, the interviews, unfortunately, are a little few and far between. Um, we uh, we we try to get a good spread of people, and that includes not just relying on the same people over and over and over again. Yeah, we have, so neither of us speak Japanese. So that's another part of the process, which is um, Den Show fortunately has someone who speaks Japanese and this is not by any means part of her job description, but she was so kind and helped us, helped pick out the sentence that um, actually that we really wanted because they would have transcriptions uh, or translations of the transcriptions. But we obviously had no idea where that was happening in the actual um, audio. And so what she would do is tell us what specific word Noah should be looking for, and then say, you need to get this word and this word, and it's happening at these times in the, um, in the clip. So she was invaluable. And that's, you know, it, there, was, there were so many barriers to including Issei voices, but she was such a huge help in that. Mm. Um, and, and for the folks out there who haven't listened to, to Kampu yet, uh, can you share about how telling the story of incarceration through audio format is, is maybe a different experience than say, learning about it in a book? You can hear it. I mean, you can hear their voices. I just, I don't think that there's anything more powerful than hearing someone tell you their own story firsthand. Um, and, you know, I don't want to underestimate like Noah's music and, you know, the storytelling that goes into it. But I, I just think hearing people's voices, hearing them speak to you directly and hearing them speak almost to each other by because, you know, they weren't actually speaking to each other, but in many ways they were telling similar stories. And so when Noah edits the voices together, it often feels like they're, they're conversing back and forth. We had someone write to us, and this is my favorite piece of feedback that we've ever gotten. She said that listening to the podcast felt like listening to old friends because she knew so many of the people that had been interviewed. Um, I, I think I actually, I, I should uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, we, because of the style of the Buddha in the attic, uh, Julia Otsuka's book, Hannah mentioned, uh, where it's it's a first person plural narrative, um, where there is just this collective narration that both uh, talks about a lot of the kind of universal experiences, but also uh, there are uh, many stories that are still told in first person plural, but are, are about a very specific person 
or um, a just there, there are these group memories, but also these individual ones. It's, it's very, very interesting. Um, and we we're, were trying so hard uh, initially to find out how we could convey that um, sense. Uh, and I, I hope uh, we managed it uh, somewhat effectively. We, um, but yeah, we, we tried to uh, edit them so the incarcerees are talking with each other, uh, layer their voices on top of each other so you can hear kind of the, the refrains and the similar patterns and the, the words they use, um, the similar quality to their voices. Um, and uh, get them to answer questions, get them uh, answer each other's questions, uh, respond to each other's experiences. So it's a lot of fun as far as editing, but it, it takes a while and it's uh, a bit of sleight of hand. Um, yeah, I love that because I noticed when I listened to it, it did sound like these people are talking to each other, but also having that knowledge of Den Show, I'm like, wow, these 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 interviews are conducted solo. So it's just, it's very thoughtful how you folks did that work. Um, and, you know, as you know, the theme of our DOR this year is collections. Um, and I wanted to ask what made the two of you decide to center each episode of Kampu on a different mundane part of a collection, like from rocks to, to fences to cameras? I think it, it goes back to the idea that we wanted to include many incarcerees voices. Um, and I think Noah said this earlier that that was the primary goal for us was centering the oral histories and not just centering one person's voice. We wanted it to be clear that there were so many different experiences here and that some, in some ways they were very similar and in some ways they were completely different. And I think that, you know, we, we, we thought about several different options. One of them was to center it around an individual person. Another of them was to do a kind of chronological thing. The thing about a chronological approach is that it would really limit us um, in terms of how many episodes we could create because you'd want at some point to end up with the end, right? You'd want to end up with the end of the war. Um, and I think the idea was that we wanted to keep being, to be able to expand this narrative and that if it started with pre-war, went on to Pearl Harbor, went on to forced removal, it would be following kind of a similar pattern to a lot of the work that's been done before. Um, and it's all really important work. I don't want to underestimate that, but also I think we kind of had the liberty to not have to think from that perspective because that work has been done before. So what I love about objects is that so many people speak about them, but they can speak about them in very, very different ways, you know. So in the rocks episode, we have people who are talking about rock gardens, we have people who are rock collecting, we have people who um, are talking about hiking in um, Tule Lake, hiking up to the rock at, Tule, at the top of Tule Lake. Um, we have people who are talking about Heart Mountain and rocks there, people who are talking about engraving on rocks. You know, there's just so many different possible relationships with one subject. And that was something that I really loved. I will also say I'm on the advisory council for um, 50 Objects, which is a wonderful public history project led by Nancy Ukai. And um, her approach is also very, object oriented. And I think we have a somewhat different approach to that project. She like really zooms in into such depth in, into one object. And I think that's so amazing. And I think ours is more that we take that object as kind of a, a jumping off point to think about the ways we could have different relationships with an object. Um, but you know, objects are something that is like, it's, I come from a public history background. I used to work in museums. People attach a lot of meaning and importance to objects. And I think that when you have a history of having those objects taken from you, like a lot of Japanese Americans do, that those objects take on even more importance. And so because we have a limited set of options, you know, a lot of people left stuff, left so much stuff behind when they left the camps, right? Um, 
and they lost so much stuff in the forced removal and in the resettlement process, you know, there's so much loss that happened there that I think the objects themselves carry even more importance because of that. Um, I think honestly, the objects, I mean, there's a certain intimacy to them, right? Because they're, they're very regular things. Um, you, it, you don't necessarily know everything about a person and uh, their experience in life from what from like these grand historical events or uh, legislation or uh, speechifying, but you can you can really tell a lot about people and how how they lived and who they are and uh, the pain they experienced and the joy of their lives um, from from just uh, the parts of the, the things they included in their lives. And um, as far as collections, uh, I mean, it, it's uh, kind of this thing where uh, I, I think uh, archivists and uh, collections in general are, are just really undervalued. Um, and that, that came to light, uh, I mean, for me personally working on this project uh, because we we couldn't have done anything approaching this uh, without Ben Show and all the work they've been doing prior and all the organizations and the people who donated their own oral, uh, oral histories to Dencho's collection. Um, there, there was so much groundwork laid here. And um, I mean, for collections, I, I think people don't really value them until they need them. And I, I will say one thing, uh, we uh, recently lost our grandmother and um, the, uh, to, to COVID to be clear. And um, going through uh, an empty house that felt really just so, so empty without her um we my, my dad and i uh were quarantining in there for two weeks because we'd been at her bedside while she was dying and um it it was just it was such a help in the grieving process to walk around her house and find the things she'd collected and the stuff hidden in her closet um, that she'd forgotten about. The, the pictures, the scrapbooks from her, her college years. Um, and just, I don't know, meeting this person again who had played such a large role in both our lives. I have, uh... If you look up here, I have a quilt that my great grandmother sewed that was that Noah and my dad sent to me from our grandmother grandmother's house. So I always have it in the back of my Zoom window so I can think about her whenever I whenever I need to. Mm, I love that. And I'm, I'm sorry to both of you for your loss. Thank you. Um, well, moving on to our last question, because we're about out of time, um, and it's an important one. I know a lot of DOR programs, including ours, like to focus on, I guess, the role of, of understanding incarceration's history as a part of our future and our role as young people in uh, preserving this history and then the legacy. And I'm curious to ask, what are some things that you hope your listeners walk away with? Um, I did see online that you folks put up some like question guides that seem to be reaching out to uh, maybe students, you know, to, to get their, their um, I guess, get more ideas of how they can like reach out to their own family members or thinking about how to preserve this history. So what, what are some things you hope that we all walk away with? Um, yeah, I think, you know, we do try absolutely to connect our history with what's happening in the present. So we do talk about immigrant detention. Um, and we also try and understand that Japanese American incarceration fit into a much longer history of oppression in this country that 
it didn't start in 1942. It didn't even start in 1900. It goes back to, you know, the, the enslavement of black people in the United States. It goes back to American Indian dispossession and their confinement in on reservations. It goes back much deeper and all of these histories of oppression are connected. And I think that we believe strongly that we need to understand each other's histories if we're going to kind of pave a path towards a better future. So I think that this is us trying to do our part to help people understand our history and to also understand how that history relates to what's going on in the present and what happened before us. Um, I think on a more personal note, um, like, like I said, um, and like we talk about in the podcast, uh, silence, I think, uh, and a, a difficulty in communication in part rooted in language and part rooted in the trauma of the camps is really central to being the descendant of Japanese American incarcerators in that experience. And I, I think it's honestly central to a lot of immigrant experiences. Um, and I, I think what I uh, would like people to take away from it is that uh, that uh, talking about these issues and uh, expressing your thoughts and the visibility of our stories and our experiences, these things may not feel like they matter, but it is personally fulfilling in a very real way to be closer to your loved ones uh, by communicating with them. Uh, and I, I just think that that silence is so lonely and so isolating for all involved. And um, it, it's, I don't know. I, I think uh, what working on this podcast has impressed upon me is um, that that closeness is really, I think, what we as human beings crave in our lives and is what is personally fulfilling to, to us. And uh, especially to um, younger Japanese Americans like myself and Hannah, um, I think you, you you miss it when, once it's not there. Uh, you I miss the questions I never got to ask my grandma. Um, and this history, sometimes it, it sometimes we really want to buy into this idea that we are Americans, we are the model minority. The the Japanese part doesn't matter, but um this is our history and it is personally so fulfilling to interact with it to tell it and to hear people talk about it yeah and i think it, it's that idea that our history heal knowing our history is a path towards healing for so many of us um we've heard that from so many listeners and those comments are the ones that just mean so much to me. It's like when Asanse reaches out and says, like, I, we had someone reach out just the other day who was saying, you know, she'd learned about some of the themes and had actually tried to talk to her mom about them. And her mom has dementia, but also that, you know, when she started talking about food in camp and when she could say like, you know, did you have apple butter in camp, which she had learned from the podcast, her mom immediately lit up and could start talking about that. And so, you know, for some of us, it's about knowing the stories that still remain to us. And for some of us, it's also about like finding the stories that, you know, we, we didn't know how to ask about. Um, so I hope that that 
the podcast helps with that for so many Sansei and Yonsei. Wow, I love that. I love hearing about these responses that you've been getting from from listeners that are just so personal. Yeah. Um, that's great. Uh, well, Hannah and Noah, I think I speak on behalf of our DOR committee here when I say that it's just been an honor getting to have you to be a part of our virtual DOR. Um, you know, as we as we continue to rely on all things digital and virtual during this time, it's been very cool to have have Compu to to turn to to continue learning these stories um, in a newer format, I guess, than we're used to. Um, and Densha also just has some of the most impressive archive of oral history. So it's wonderful to see those being used in a, an educational and accessible way. So thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for having us. It was such a thank pleasure you. to be with you. Great. Um, so Alvin, I'm gonna hand this back to you to introduce our next set of interviewees. Um, thanks everyone. Yes, thank you again, uh, Hannah and Noah. Um, I. I've listened to some of the podcasts and they're just absolutely wonderful and I encourage everyone to go and listen to them. Um, now, do the two of you have to leave us now or? Uh, I have to, sorry. Uh, okay. I, I may have to step out temporarily, but I'll, I'll be back. Okay. Bye. <laughs> well, thank you, Hannah. So um, our next collection that we'll be focusing on um, is from the CSU Japanese American Digitization Project. And for that, um, I'm going to uh, have Eileen uh, Yoshimura take over. All right, thank you, Alvin. And thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we are very excited uh, to be able to share with you some of the newer collections at California State University Dominguez Hills. And today we have with us Greg Williams, who is the director of the Archives and Special Collections Department at the university. And we also have Jennifer Hill, who is a project archivist at the university. And she's worked with a number of the collections that you will be hearing about today. So over the next half hour, we'll be getting to know all about the Japanese American Digitization Project which is also known as JAD, you'll be hearing that term. And we'll be taking a look at some of those collections and a even closer look at Aiko Herzig Yoshinaga's collection as well. And we'll be showing you how easy it is to access these collections and documents. And we'll also be telling you about what happens to documents once they're donated to the university. And then we'll wrap it up with some closing remarks. So sit back and relax, get your cup of coffee or tea, uh, and we'll get started. Uh, we'll get started with Greg uh, telling us about the Japanese American Digitization Project. What is it exactly? And um, you know, what is its purpose? Uh, and what is its current status today? Thank you, Eileen. Um, the CSU Japanese American Digitization Project started with the idea of going around to the various CSU uh, archives in California and gathering the material that they had collected over the years and digitizing that material. We ended up getting material from 18 different California State Universities and uh, putting it into our uh, website at Cal State Dominguez Hills. In addition, after we went through and got the material from the, uh, the CSUs, we added another 11 institutions ranging from the Eastern California Museum to uh, the California Historical Society. Um, it's, uh, it's been funded through seven or eight uh, national, local and state grants and foundation grants. The goal was to improve access to uh, CSU archival material, but it was also to bring access to this, this important and uh, ever-growing uh, material. The interesting thing that we uh, found along the way was that people would also and are still donating material. And for instance, the second National Park Service grant that we got was based on the fact that we'd collected a lot of new stuff bef uh, during the first N NPS grant. And so um, it's, uh, 
it's been um, a long um, process that we're very happy to. We've had great help from the different CSU archivists. We've had great help from our staff archivists, Yoko Okushinishi Oka and um, Jennifer Hill and several others. And um, basically uh, we're, um, we're, we're, we're moving along. We've still got funding for another year or two and we're still looking for more collections. And it's sort of amazing that these collections keep popping up for us to digitize our catalog and, and grow the collection. And so, um, tell, and so in total, how many documents is in JAD now? We have over 45,000 documents, not including the stuff we added this week. Um, this includes uh, letters, uh, materials from camp, uh, photograph collections that don't necessarily have anything to do with camp, uh, photograph collections that are related to camp, and um, uh, uh, anything that, that archives, archivists in the other institutions feel uh, they want to uh, digitize. It, it's um, been um, really fascinating to see how this collection has grown we also have um, many, many oral histories from Cal State Fullerton in the project. And um, this grant, it basically uh, we get the grants and then we spread the funding around the different uh, institutions, Cal State Sacramento, Fresno State, S uh, San Jose State, um, and um, the Historical Society of Long Beach. And we've even got material from the Gardena uh, Valley JVC, JVI. JCI, uh -huh. yeah, and I understand that there was a, or still is a task force uh, for this project of which Aiko Herzeg Yoshinaka was a member. Yes, when we started in 2014, we had a, a scholarly uh, advisory committee and we all met at Dominguez Hills uh, Iko was on that committee, Roger Daniels was on that committee, Don Hada, um, uh, any number, Tom Akita from Densho, uh, any number of uh, others whose names mm -hmm. come and go. And, uh, but yes, um, mm -hmm. and they have, been, Lane Hiriabashi was also on it at that time. Mm -hmm. And they have really uh, helped us along with, with, with deciding things we were especially conscious of language. Uh, we used um, we used Denshaw's terminology list, but when we found that Denshaw didn't have a lot about agriculture and other things, we've added to that. And um, so we have we have uh, attempted to uh, use the correct terminology. One one interesting story is um, we got a. Um, uh, a lesson plan published by the National Endowment for the Humanities in their ed Excitement project. Uh, and in the scheme, we use the term throughout the lesson plan, incarceration or concentration camp or other things, we avoided internment. But when we got um, to the decision for them to publish it, they insisted that they had to use the word internment because it was too close to home for the Trump administration that if we were using incarceration. Uh, interesting. I hope we can change that. Soon. Yes. Uh, yeah, it sounds like um, a lot of documents. Uh, so how easy is it for someone from the public to access them? Um, we're going to show later how to access uh, our database. I would just say that if you find that our database is too clunky, the material, the 46,000 items, uh, for the most part, on um, the, the website are accessible also on Calisphere, the UC's Digital Archive, and the Digital Public Library of America, which is a national uh, digital archive of materials. You can also, I, I believe, uh, access the material on, on Dencho's uh, website. Mm. And 
And if it weren't for COVID, uh, the public could actually go to the archives and, and see the documents firsthand on site. Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. One of our selling points is that we are a medium-sized archive. We are a medium-sized university that, that tries to make things accessible. When a family donates material, we all always tell them that it's here for you to come and, come and uh, look at. Uh, it's, it's, Dominguez Hills is, a, you can get there by about four different highways. And um, yes, it's, it's, it's accessible to the family members uh, forever. And what we, we try to tell them, if the material is sitting in your garage or a closet, it's not going to help anybody. And it's, it, it's, it's, if you, if the families feel that it's, it's important to get the material out there, we're happy to take it and digitize it. Sometimes we'll return the material if they want to. Other times we'll, we'll, we'll convince them that there's a good temperature controlled place in our archive uh, for it. Uh, the interesting thing about Dominguez Hills is that we have, um, we have a, a relatively new building, 10 years old, and we still haven't filled up our archives. It'll happen mm -hmm. soon, but, um, but we still have space. All right, thank you. So let's next take a look at some of the collections within JAD. Uh, Greg or Jennifer, um, tell us about what type of collections are included and how they were selected to be included. So there's, uh, like Greg had mentioned earlier, there's definitely um, many different types of collections within and at CSU JAD. Um, we have family and organization collections and the topics range from immigration to the United States, incarceration, and the redress movement. Um, the collections are selected based on their topics and their research value. Okay, so among the 60 collections that we have, we're gonna next take a look at some examples, which both you and uh, Greg could tell us about. So the first one uh, that's up on the screen is the Jim and Eric Saito family collection. Um, it contains material from Saito family members who lived in San Francisco and Los Angeles. It includes immigration documents, uh, Japanese citizen renunciation papers, family trees, photo albums, incarceration camp material, um, material from high school like yearbooks, and redress papers. And the, um, the, the young woman who's sitting there at Heart Mountain she collected a scrapbook of dance cards and uh, those are now in, in our archive. The Eric Saito called me up one day looking to, to find out more about a, uh, the, uh, accessing the, uh, digitizing the collection. He'd seen an article in Rav Shrimpo about six months before and it was just uh, luck that we, uh, I answered the phone and I, Yoko and I went down to his, his place and we started looking and we've been getting material from that family's archive for three or four years now. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the Okine collection has, has, a, has an interesting collection. I believe uh, Don Hada and Judd Grenier uh, went to an abandoned farmhouse somewhere near the, the Dominguez Hills campus. They found um, the Okine family uh, a farm. They, were, uh, they, were, uh, they grew flowers uh, and they found stuff, I think Don said in the walls uh, <laughs> and other things. It's a great collection. Uh, part of the collection was left with the Gardena Valley JVI uh, and part of it was left with Dominguez Hills. So in 2016, we discovered this trunk in the parking lot of the JVI. Um, and it was filled with uh, wonderful additional material. When we had an exhibit in 2017 or 18, we got family members to come. Uh, and um, the, the, there's a photograph of a woman in a black shirt uh, next to the, the, the trunk, and that's her, uh, I believe that's her, in, in, in one of the small photos in the trunk. Um, 
and then uh, more family members came and we, we had a, a really uh, nice uh, visit with them. And we, um, we found photographs of uh, the woman sitting in the middle uh, her, of her wedding in another collection. So mm -hmm. things uh, are always informative and interesting. So this is the uh, Kyoko Maeda Yoshioka family photographs. Uh, it includes images documenting life before World War II and after World War II. It also includes a short essay by Mary Higuchi and a handout from a sewing class at Poston. Um, Kiyoko was a Kibe Nisei who was born in Santa Monica. She returned to the United States from Japan in 1937 and, sort of, and settled on Terminal Island. This collection was actually a scanning day event collection um, from an event that happened with the Gardena Valley JCI in Dominguez Hills in 2018. And the, uh, did we go here? That's oh, a different order. Uh, one thing about uh, Terminal Island collection, uh, another collection that I received from a gentleman who worked at the, with, for the Navy, they were, they were throwing out photographs one day. This gentleman grabbed from the trash photographs of the Terminal Island empty with all of its houses still intact in, in like March of 1943 before it was destroyed entirely. Uh, that, that's, that's very interesting stuff. The Nino Mia photograph studio collection, studio collection is, a, is a collection I could go on forever about. The basic things is uh, the Nino Mia family ran a photo studio from the late 20s until the 80s in Little Tokyo. Uh, our collection now consists of over 100,000 images of the photographs that the Nino Mias took of the community, of everybody, of events during um, Nisei week. Um, people have come to our archive, looked at these things and said, uh, oh, can you find my parents' wedding? And yes, indeed, it's in there. Um, the collection um, was uh, put out on the street in 2008 or nine, uh, the people living in the house were redoing it. They didn't know what to do with it. They'd ask other institutions to take it, they hadn't. So the contractor put an ad in Craigslist and told everyone, uh, come and get it. So several people came and got it and they were in these big plastic garbage bags. Um, then, uh, that one person got most of the stuff. His name was Michael Reisner, and he saved it for, for um, five years. I, I, I um, talked him into donate, donate, loaning some stuff for an exhibit. And then um, in um, 2018 or 2016, he decided that he couldn't do it. And that's the, the story of, he, he falls in love with a collection of history but he's an individual, he couldn't deal with trying to get funding for such a large and massive collection. Mm -hmm. So he finally donated it to us. We put some stuff out there that we've got this. Two more people came forward who'd been there at the Craigslist day and brought us more material from the collection. Mm -hmm. Last week, I went back to that actual house and received some business records. Mm -hmm. um, collection relationships go on and on. They don't end with one thing. Mm -hmm. um, we immediately got uh, funding um, from uh, the Haynes Foundation, an LA uh, organization that starts, um, uh, that does local archival uh, materials. And we got funding from the California State Library and their Civil Liberties Public Education Program. Um, we have digitized over 10,000 of these items and uh, we're basically taking one or two samples of each packet of, of a job, unless there's more important stuff and, and digitizing that as samples so people will know that the material is out there. Okay. The next collection that we featured today was George Nakano Family's collection. 
It includes material from uh, former assembly member and Torrance City Council member, George Nakano. George Nakano grew up in Los Angeles and his family was forcibly removed to Jerome and Tule Lake incarceration camps. Uh, the collection includes books and booklets, proposals, printed newspaper articles um, related to George Nakano's family, incarceration camps, and his political career. This collection, the Shibashi family collection, came to us several years ago. It was one of the first family collections we received during the CSU JAD project. And um, it, the family is um, a, a truck farmers in Palos Verdes. They're one of the 40 family farmers uh, in Palos Verdes. Uh, one of our most striking photographs is the family having a party on December 6th, 1941. And then the next photograph is the family in Poston. Um, nevertheless, they, they came back to Palos Verdes and it, it continued to run agricultural and truck farming for many, many decades. Um, their material also includes uh, panoramas of family funerals and, and picnics, uh, any number of correspondence and, and yearbooks. We get a lot of yearbooks, both from the camps and sometimes from um, high schools. And mm -hmm. um, that's the Ishibashi collection. Um, the Atushi Art Ishida collection is uh, one of our favorite collections. Um, Art um, took his camera, or he ordered a camera uh, from Sears uh, when he was in the Jerome camp in, um, in Arkansas, and he started taking photographs, even though there was you know, limitations about what you could do with photograph cameras in, in, in the West Coast, they didn't seem to care in, um, uh, in, in Arkansas. And so he was both a photographer, he was also worked as a lumberjack, uh, and uh, he had photographs of the Jerome Fire Department and all the interesting things in the block. Uh, this, uh, some ironic photographs is they, um, they had big ceremonies when um, they, with, with lays around their necks when they were leaving for Tule Lake. Um, mm -hmm. Art took his camera to Tule Lake and uh, talked about how he didn't like it there and his roommate uh, ran a still underneath, underneath the barrack. And, mm -hmm. um, and he, he was one of the, he wasn't a no-no boy per se. He, he uh, said no to one of the questions yet they still shipped him off to um, Tule Lake. And uh, his collection is just fascinating and wonderful. He also has donated material from his uh, service in the Korean War. He uh, came to Dominguez Hills a couple times, thanks to Eileen bringing him over. And um, we, we went over it. And, and it's interesting to hear uh, talk about Densho's oral histories. Um, his oral history was uh, with Densho was informative, interesting, and striking, but there's nothing like talking about the same things in person because he was vibrant, interested, and uh, is he 99 now? Yes, uh, I was going to say uh, Art Ishida uh, is a very good family friend of ours. He will be 100 in June of this year, uh, still very active. Um, and uh, like you were saying, Greg, he did have a camera in camp. And it was inter interesting what Noah and Hannah were saying about cameras. Uh, Art said he saved up his money in camp. And like you said, he ordered it through the catalog. <laughs> so uh, he was fortunate to be able to, to acquire one. Um, the, uh, on the slide, his, uh, the orange card is his meal ticket at um, at the, um, I've forgotten the name of the racetrack in, in LA, you know. Oh, Santa Anita. Santa Anita, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And, uh, <laughs> Sorry, the last, uh, the last collection we are talking about in this segment is the George and Mitzi Noahara collection. 
Uh, it includes photo albums and scrapbooks compiled by George and Mitzi. And it includes their experience about World War II and the Korean War. Um, it also has some um, material from the Gardena Buddhist Church. Mm -hmm. And these are my parents. Uh, they, my mother and I donated our papers to the school. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit about, about them in detail a little later. Okay, so let's talk a little more about Eichel's papers. Um, Jennifer, I know you worked on this, so why don't you describe it to us and uh, tell us a little bit more about what's in it. Of course, uh, so Eichel was a researcher for the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians. She transcribed the hearing transcripts uh, for the California Liberties Public Education Fund. Um, and she was incarcerated at three different camps, Manzanar, Jerome, and Rower. So her collection includes some of her work from the commission um, and the various projects she worked on, but it also includes her personal material, like her printed email correspondence, her photographs from World War II and post-World War II, and uh, her stamp collection, which I think is really cool. Um, do you have any further uh pictures or photographs of her collection as well? I do, I have one more slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh yeah, there, her collection has a number of her uh, photographs of her youth, uh, even pre-war and during the war uh, in, her, in her baby, uh, Jerry. Um, it just, just so endearing, just, um, you know, Greg and I had uh, we were very fortunate to have met Aiko and to have gotten to know her. Um, just a very passionate, uh, kind-hearted person. Uh, but I know, Jennifer, that you did not have the opportunity to meet her prior to her passing. So, um, so from the perspective of, of someone who never really knew Aiko, what did you learn about her as you were reviewing her papers? So for someone that's never met Aiko, I think uh, you can learn about who she was as a person. Uh, we always think of her as a researcher during the redress movement, but this collection shows um, how she grew up through her pictures. You know, you see her and her family at incarceration camps and you see her move from New York to Japan and back to New York. Um, and you see her roots and like what makes her such a, a great researcher. Um. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was going through her papers, I mean, this, she saved everything. Every little scrap paper that she put a note on, it was in there, uh, which told me that uh, she was just very meticulous, very thorough. Uh, a lot of uh, first drafts, second drafts, third drafts, a lot of editing done. Uh, a perfectionist. And she wanted to make sure that what she put out there was accurate. And that just uh, was so evident in looking at her papers as well. Um, Jennifer, so what other prominent features or significant uh, documents did you find in her papers? Um. Um, like among the correspondence, uh, she had boxes and boxes of correspondence to different people. Uh, can you tell us uh, some of the people that she corresponded with? Of course. So, um, Michi Waglin, Frank Abe, Frank Emmy, mm. Harry Ueno, Janice Tanaka were just some of the many correspondence that she had. And some other uh, prominent features in her collection, I think for me at least, was her recipe cards getting to see those, um, mm -hmm. her yearbooks mm -hmm. from Los Angeles High School in the 1940s and uh, the graduation cap she wore in 1989 when she finally received her high school diploma from Los Angeles High School. And I remember she even uh, had, uh, well included in her artifacts was her Rolodex of all her <laughs> yeah. contacts. Um, 
uh, it just and and you could tell whenever there was a change, she she crossed out the old information, put the new, and even dated it. Uh, okay. Just a very thorough person, and her contacts uh, were not only local and domestic; they were international, Europe, Japan, you name it. You know, if you corresponded with Aiko at any point, your letter may be in her collection. I didn't correspond her with a lot, and even I had something in there <laughs> of myself. So uh, it would be interesting just to look and see if your letter or your card or your, you know, newspaper clipping is in there. It, it's just a very thorough individual. Um, maybe you could tell us why she decided to donate uh, her personal papers uh, to Dominguez Hills. Well, she has her um, her her uh, materials relating to the the commission and, and her research in Washington D.C. at UCLA. Um, at the uh, we, I think uh, we, we uh, Dominguez Hills through Don Hada and through uh, many other people had a good relationship with Ico. She spoke at one event and she was on our, on our committee and she saw uh, what we were doing. And we, she saw that we were getting more and more grants. And so uh, I think it's a, it's a, it was a personal decision on her part and we were thrilled to have her materials and we, we thank her family for helping with some of the funding uh, from, from the collection. Um, it's uh, it, it's uh, basically it, it's 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 great to be able to preserve something to make it accessible and to and these days to digitize material and I, I think I think uh, she liked uh, the archives at Dominguez Hills because we we knew her and she knew us and she um, appreciated the work we were doing. And um, so we're, we're very, very happy that she uh, donated the materials. Yes, I had been helping Aiko to inventory her papers uh, prior to them being uh, physically donated to the school, but unfortunately she passed away before that could be done. So uh, her children, uh, David Abe and Lisa Furutani uh, followed through on her a desire to have them donated to the school. And we thank them very much for their uh, support as well. Um, okay. So let's talk about what happens to papers once they're donated to the school. Um, I'll, I'll speak a little bit to this because like I said, I had the pleasure and the honor to work with Greg and Jennifer on processing Eichel's papers. Uh, she donated about 26 boxes of papers, photographs, artifacts. And as uh, Greg was saying, uh, donations are commonly uh, given to the school in, in, this, um, in boxes. And they've usually been in garages or someone's house or storage. So we take those and we bag them up and we put them in cold storage to get all the bugs and the insects out. And once that's done, then we go through all the documents and try to try to make sense of everything, uh, try to organize it to what best um, uh, suits the collection. So in Aiko's case, again, she had several files of correspondence. Uh, she had uh, photographs, uh, she had working papers. So those became some major categories. And then we look through the documents for appropriateness uh, based on guidelines and law. We, for example, exclude personal medical information or um, financial information. So those are usually excluded or based upon the donor's wish, he or she may want other types of documents excluded. So those are taken out as well. 
And so once we do this, then they're put into acid-free uh, files and boxes, as you see on the screen. And they're stored in temperature-controlled um, uh, rooms. And uh, there's a picture there of my mother and I uh, going through some of her, her photographs. Uh, I want to tell you, it, it was hard for her to let go. But I think she realized that her daughter, me, was not going to store these in my house. <laughs> I didn't have much room. So uh, my mom finally agreed to donate her collection. And, and she was very happy that she did. Um, and then finally, we do what we call a uh, collection guide. And I mean, this is a remarkable document. It tells you all about the collection, all about the donor. And it's like an index of all the documents so that if you're looking for a particular item, uh, you could find it easily using this guide versus going through all the boxes yourself. So do you have anything to add to that, Greg or Jennifer? Sure, that uh, the box, uh, the photograph of the yellow envelope where all the negatives and used to live, they would fold the prints and the, uh, they would keep the negatives in there. Um, we received, uh, what about 10 garbage bags filled with these things? The only way we knew how to even begin was to basically carefully slide them out of the uh, out of the bag onto the floor in a carpeted floor in in one of our areas, and um, uh, we just started. We had a, a group of four or five students and archivists, and we just started putting them in by year because the Nino Mia collection is relatively organized if it's all together. For instance. You could be the, the, the 50th uh, client of the year 1956. Uh, and and all, these all this stuff was mixed up in what, but we finally were able to organize it. And it ends up in boxes like the other photographs show. Processing is both something that is mind-numbingly confusing at times, especially when you're starting to go through records. Uh, but once you get an understanding of the people and, and, and the rec types of records in a collection, uh, the organization makes sense. And you're then able to connect different uh, items. For instance, um, uh, an orphaned photograph will somehow connect to a letter and then you'll know who's in that letter. On the other hand, uh, there is, uh, with, with the Nino Mia photograph collection, it, 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 the, the people who purchased the thing are identified. So for instance, if a, a father-in-law bought the photographs of a wedding, you're not necessarily going to have the name of, of the bride in there. You might have the name of the groom. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a very complicated sometimes underdo, un understanding. But the basic thing about archival work is that we're there to organize it and make it accessible, but we're not there to make uh, make you understand exactly what the consensus uh, is. It's, it's, it's there, uh, we need, what am I trying to say? Uh, basically, um, we, we leave it to historians to analyze and, and, and critique it, especially folks like doing the Den Show blog. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, um, it's there and it's uh, accessible. And uh, it's so funny when you hear, um, People say, oh, we discovered this item, long lost item that nobody ever seen. Well, when it was cataloged in an archive, it's been around. It's just not uh, noticeable until somebody goes looking for it. And hopefully we give you the clues in the archives for that. So another frequently asked question is, does this cost me anything to donate my documents? Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, not at all. Uh, we would, uh, I would add that it's helpful if, if family members or uh, others donate funding to buy supplies, uh, fund the, the, a cataloger for six months or, or some th such like that. But we don't uh, require that because like I said, we're a newer archive. We want collections. We want to preserve them. They're in pretty good shape right now. 
and they get in better shape. And so the long-term idea is preservation, access to the family and researchers and students. And um, we, 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 I think we've been doing a pretty good job of that. Okay, let's um, see a demo on how to actually uh, access one of these documents. First, so what we're gonna do is we are going to go to the CSU job site and click um, search the collection. So from here, you can see that you can select browse or a number of pre-selected topics like camp newsletters and camp photographs. If we select browse, sorry, let me scoot my screen over. <laughs> There's several different options that we can choose from. So uh, you can click on one of the contributing repositories or one of our partners. You can also select whether you're interested in looking at correspondence or photographs or albums. We also have a selection here where you can um, search for specific incarceration camps or specific subjects like portrait photography, uh, Nisei, um, incarcerates, or a specific collection if you know which collection you're looking at. So for instance, I'm gonna briefly show you how to look at Ico's collection. So we can click on Dominguez Hills and scroll down to the bottom. And we can see that Aiko Herzig Yoshinaga Papers is here. So this is just some of her collection with her, uh, primarily her photographs. After looking at her photographs, you can see a brief description of what it is and some other information here. If we are looking at Another uh, collection that I wanna give an example for is the Georgian Mitzi Noahara collection. Also the same steps, I can search by uh, the contributing repository and scroll down to find Georgian Mitzi Noahara's papers. Mm -hmm. And I am interested in looking at official documents. Mm -hmm. So from looking at this official document, I can see the information related to the document. And if I select these two blue arrows off to the side, I can expand it. And it'll show the front and the back or the multiple pages that are with that document. Yeah, and that's actually signed by my grandfather, Tomoske Masakawa. Signature of alien, <laughs> Tomoske Masakawa. <laughs> There's that term that we had mentioned earlier today. Right, right. No. Um, so if you are, or if anybody is interested in looking at any of these collections and you need some help or assistance, you can always reach out to Dominguez Hills. Um, and then one thing I would like to note is navigating this on a tablet or a phone is a little bit different than navigating this on a like laptop. Mm. Well, it must be easy because I heard from a few of my cousins that uh, when they saw my family papers on the JSTA website, they started scrolling through it and they were just delighted to find photographs of their own parents. So. Well, that's good. I always uh, love to yeah. hear stories like that. Yeah. So it works. Uh, Jennifer, if we could go mm -hmm. back to the, uh, the website um this uh this website uh went live uh this redo of the website went live uh, last week um we have uh, a whole list of every collection physical collection that we have uh culled material from we don't take everything from a particular physical collection it has events like this it has a couple of digital exhibits uh, some information about joining the project. And then uh, if you want to click the resources, we have a user guide for students who want to use this collection, research resources, how to get more context for some of these researchers, educator resources, which are lesson plans for teachers. And then of course, the famous and most exciting best practices for librarians <laughs> and archivists. And then there's the about us, which has the project history, funding participants, and, and whatnot. Um, and uh, you can search the collection with that, that button. I would 
uh, like to add that we are very, very grateful to community members who have donated materials or loaned us materials. And we're very, very grateful to the other institutions who have loaned stuff. We have material not only from the CSU, but from one University of California campus, uh, UCSB. Um, we're always open to more suggestions about other materials that we could um, uh, add to the collection. Um, and we're also expanding more and more into some redress issues. We have some papers from N NCRR. Um, and um, so it's, uh, we're, we're pleased that this thing is expanding by, mm -hmm. by the minute. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, it, it is very easy if I could do it. I think any of you out there could do it too. And so Greg, there, I understand we have a few new collections at JAD. Yeah, uh, when we um, get material from other history agencies, we're just sort of shocked and surprised at the amount of material that we get and that they're actually willing to make the stuff accessible and put on our database. They can certainly use it for whatever pr process they want. A material that was cataloged by uh, Yoko this week um, is uh, the American Civil Liberties Union in Northern California records, their case file on Fred Korematsu. Here is a letter uh, from Korematsu to Ernst, Ernst Bisick, the head of the uh, Northern California ACLU. Uh, they didn't want him to take on Korematsu because uh, they were worried about um, uh, insulting Roosevelt back east, but, but Bursig did anyways. Another uh, collection is the Joseph R. Goodman papers. And um, he is, uh, he, his collection includes letters from a gentleman named Lincoln Kanai, who was sort of the head of the Japanese YMCA in San Francisco. Uh, Goodman went to Topaz and taught and was an activist against incarceration, even uh, the minute that it happened. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I'm very glad to get this material into there. Mm -hmm. It's more than probably, I mean, you can count them, but I don't know, there's probably at least 40 letters from Korematsu in, in this collection. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's exciting. Oh, very good. Uh, well, uh, Given the time that we have left, uh, let's get to our closing remarks. And what I would like to do is just throw this question out to both Greg and uh, Jennifer, if you'd like to comment. Uh, you know, again, uh, collections like these do preserve the actual documents, but what other benefits um, do you see in donating uh, documents to an institution like Dominguez Hills? Jennifer? So as a, as a recent graduate and former Dominguez Hill student, um, collections like these are just invaluable tools for students and, and community researchers. Um, having access to these collections gives students and researchers the, the opportunity to learn about the past firsthand through letters and books and photographs and other types of material. In um, archives these days, there is a enormous amount of discussion about who creates the archive and what, what the uh, implications are behind uh, somebody collecting something. Um, my old fashioned idea of a collection is that it's the papers of activists and the papers of ordinary people that give us eventually the truth and uh, or their truth. And it's, it's not for me to analyze everything that's in an archive, but it's for me to make that stuff accessible. And the job of CSU JAD has been to, uh, to, to bring attention to the fact that an, an archive like this exists and to build it as much as we can and it will, it will serve researchers for many decades to come. So we're, um, uh, 
you know, we're aware of, of, of the implications of collecting material, but we're also aware of the fact that uh, if the individual wants to make the material accessible, we're here to make it accessible. And mm -hmm. we have got a, a record of getting the funding to do that. And um, mm -hmm. uh, so, yes. Mm -hmm. And just from a personal perspective, uh, as you saw, my parents' papers were donated to the university. Um, you know, rather have it sit in my garage or my house until my kids are ready to have it sit in their garage or their house. Again, I convinced my mom to donate them to the school. Um, and so I know that they'll always be there. They'll always be there for my kids when they're ready to see them and for their kids. And they'll be well preserved and they could access them now online or actually go in to see them if they wanted to. And, um, you know, you might think, well, my, my documents aren't interesting to anyone. And you'll be surprised. I had a UC Irvine uh, doctor, doctorate candidate uh, come in to the archives and look at my father's papers. And she utilized them uh, for one of her research papers. So you never know who uh, your information will be valuable to. Um, and uh, the papers themselves are a goldmine for, um, again, like this UC Irvine student, for uh, topics of research that students could uh, utilize for not only undergrad, but for graduate and doctoral programs. So in closing, um, as you could see, collections are not only to preserve documents, but they're also to preserve the history behind them for generations to come. And we know that this was very important to ICO, especially as it related to the Japanese American World War II experience. And while, you know, like Noah and, and Hannah commented, while sometimes these collections may, may be happy or they may be sad, uh, but they also preserve the truth and the lessons uh, learned, for example, from the social injustices that were experienced during the Nikkei World War II experience, that you know, in the face of such social injustices, we speak up to ensure that they never ever be repeated again. Uh, so with that, thank you all for joining us. Uh, again, thank you to Greg and Jennifer for your participation. A uh, special shout out to filmmakers John Osaki and Janice Tanaka for their contributions to the uh, timeline of Ico's life on the JCI website. Uh, you could see clips from John's alternative facts and from Janice's Rebel with a Cause. So with that, we hope you all enjoyed our discussion today and found it interesting and meaningful. So I'll turn it back to Alvin. Now, we've got a few uh, audience questions. Um, so let's uh, take a few of those. Um, thank you again for, uh, for, for all your uh, participation in this uh, program here. Now, let's see. Is it possible to include archives from UC colleges to uh, make an a, a even more complete collection? Uh, yes. If, uh, if there's an agreement and there's, there's funding and there's grants, um, we've already done, like I said, the uh, you uh, see Santa Bar some of the UC Santa Barbara material. Um, it, you know, I, I started this project, or we, the CSU archivists, started it to emphasize the fact that the CSU archives had an enormous amount of uh, archival, important archival material. Since, uh, since then, we've expanded it to any number of local history agencies, and um, we'll, see, uh, we'll see where it goes. It's two prong. We're collecting personal papers, and we're collecting. Um, we'll, we'll add institutional materials um, as as we go along. Um, 
can you say anything about the collections or types of collections you anticipate adding to the archives? Uh, it's usually, well, like I said, we're, we're looking for uh, redress materials these days. We're also, we'll also, we also take local history materials. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't think we've, we've, we've run out of uh, personal papers uh, of, of people in, in the area, but, um, you know, things just pop out. We, uh, we had uh, one of the faculty on our campus was doing an art project and wanted to uh, digitize the high school uh, newspapers at Topaz. So we talked to the, the curator at the Topaz Museum and we were able to digitize that set of newspapers. Um, so it's, it's a surprise. Um, it, it's, it, it, one, one, one interesting thing is um, we have a, a good deal of material on the Southern California Gardeners Association. The people that were donating that material knew some people who had recently passed away. And luckily they knew about us, they saved, they, uh, their friends gave them one, a photo album from Heart Mountain and two, a photo album from Manzanar, uh, invaluable and, and good stuff. So this is both a collection project and a uh, digitization project. So um, it's uh, nice to see it move on. Also, um, we've got Noah here still. Um, question, on a personal basis, uh, do you think that this journey that you've gone through has helped you connect uh, with your culture or family in, in any special way? Um, I will be perfectly frank. I, I think like many younger Japanese Americans was not terribly um, well connected, I feel like, to Japanese American history. I, I knew, uh, I knew the synopsis. Um, I knew some parts of my, of how it affected my family, but I hadn't really been immersed in it until uh, working on this podcast. And um, yeah, it, it <laughs> long story short, it, it was really, I, I keep coming back to this phrasing, but personally fulfilling for me. Um, I, um, I did not grow up in a very Japanese American or Asian American even community. Um, the Japanese Americans aren't uh, concentrated um, in DC quite like they are on the West Coast. Um, and to some extent, I, I think also being mixed race, I, I felt a little distant from that because there, there's always the trap and some of the incarcerees actually talk about this even where um, you don't look uh, white to white people, but you don't look, um, you, you don't look fully Japanese to Japanese Americans either. And uh, especially during my teenage years, some part of me resented that. Um, and resented all the implications of being associated with the model minority. Um, and I, I'm not sure even when I passed that phase in my life, I really, I, I didn't make an active effort to seek out that history. And, um, that was a mistake. Um, that it's been remarkably, uh, remarkably um, just good, uncategorically good for me to engage with this history and to uh, spend all this time listening to Incarcerate's talk um, in just so many ways. And I'm uh, as I said, I'm, I'm still processing my grandmother's death. Um, 
but I'm glad to have uh, had a little bit better tools to understand her as a person and her, in really her, her last months. Um, on the uh, JAD materials, um, are the materials in the archive restricted in any way? Is it under fair use? Uh, not really, no. Um, our, uh, we, we get permission from the donors to put the material up. Um, each campus that owns the material uh, has a, a similar procedures to getting it copied. Um, so each researcher needs to look and see which campus the material is from and then uh, note that and, and see if they can uh, go ahead and do that. With CSUDH, we want everything accessible. And um, I think uh, there, there generally aren't any rules, except if there's something that's published and uh, then the researcher has to do that, uh, that analysis as to whether it, it should be published or not. But generally everything uh, to our uh, rules are, is, is accessible. Until we're asked to take it off. Mm -hmm. We've had a couple instances where people have said, I don't want that photograph up. Or I, uh, that photograph is of somebody that uh, is not in my life anymore. Uh, take it off. But, but those are, that's no more than two instances, and they're relatively minor. Um, this actually could be a question for anyone. Um, any advice? for people who want to record or collect their own family's histories? Um, uh, does anybody want to, want to start? I can offer a little bit of insight on the recording part, actually, especially. Well, I would say just do it. Yes. Do it. Don't wait. Time is of the essence. Memories fade. Sorry, Eileen. There's lots of great apps to help out, uh, especially with oral histories and stuff too. Um, I can't think of them off the top of my head, but if anybody needs to email me and ask, I'm, I'm more than willing to look those up and, and help you out there. Noah, you had some ideas? Uh, yeah, so the what uh, audio people will often tell you is that the, usually the best mic that most people have is in their phone and it, and they don't know they have it and the best speakers they don't know they have incidentally are in their cars um so uh honestly it, I, I know it can be uh intimidating and uh, honestly even just prohibitively pricey to record interviews um with uh buying all the gear and searching through all the technical details and stuff. But um, there are a bunch of great apps on your phone that you can record uh, really high quality uh, uh, interviews with. And the uh, best way to do this is to point the end that you talk into, um, close your mouth, lay it on a flat surface on top of uh, something soft, like a, a towel, a shirt, a, a pillow, or a cushion will work really well for this, actually. Um, and just point it either at, at your mouth, at the mouth of whoever's talking, uh, put it somewhere between uh, one or one and three, five feet away, um, and uh, I, I, I would advise you to uh, try to keep a, an eye on the data because uh, those, those files can uh, get somewhat large if it goes on for a, a huge amount of time. But um, that is how we recorded all our uh, interviews with our experts uh, for Compu. And uh, it turned out pretty well. And, and basically with, with uh, archival collections and audio collections, make sure uh, you, you know the, the run, uh, who, what, why, where, and when, and um, uh, give us context. And that context can turn into 
life-saving material for 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 archivists to uh, increase increase information about the item. Thank you very much. I'm I'm gonna get to the end of the program here. So thank you for your questions. Um, I thank you to Greg and Jennifer and Noah uh, for taking their time to be with us today. And I wanna encourage everyone out there to, yeah, help uh, add to this story of our community and uh, save your documents and, and uh, preserve them for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now at this time, uh, we've got a uh, short video on uh, behalf of the Japanese Latin Americans seeking redress. Please support the Campaign for Justice Redress Now for Japanese Latin Americans. The JLA redress struggle continues. Last year, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights published its ruling in the Shibayama Brothers' Petition for Justice. The U.S. government owes reparations to JLAs for World War II human rights violations. You can help by signing our petition to U.S. President Biden to comply with the Commission's ruling and to meet with the JLAs to secure reparations. To sign the petition and for more information, please go to the Campaign for Justice website and Facebook page. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, over this past week, hopefully you've been uh, looking at the GBJCI Day of Remembrance uh, web pages. And along with the Densho Kampu podcast and uh, uh, CSU JAD materials, uh, there's a lot of uh, other materials on the site. Um, there's a tribute to Lane Hirabayashi, um, who educated many of us about the incarceration of Nikkei and was a big supporter of the community and of the GBJCI. Um, there's also a tribute to Rose Ochi, who uh, passed away in December. Um, her career in politics gave her a platform to advocate for redress among uh, many efforts. Um, she testified at the Commission on the Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians, and she helped other people prepare their testimonies. Um, notably, she was the first Asian American to serve as uh, Assistant uh, Attorney General under Clinton. Um, she worked with uh, Mayor Tom Bradley's office. Um, she was an executive at the JCL. Um, she offered legal and political support to the Manzanar Committee. I mean, um, she contributed a lot to uh, the Nikkei community, and uh, we're all going to miss her presence. Um, so, if you want to learn more about her, go to the website. Um, there's also a uh, wonderful oral history uh, of the South Bay JSCL oral history collection. And there's also a selection of Tonka, which is a Japanese style of poetry. Uh, we have some Tonka from an anthology of, called Poets Behind Barbed Wire. Um, there are a lot of people and organizations who contributed time and materials uh, to the web pages, and we thank them all. Um, in terms of um, timeline, um, I know the CSU uh, Japanese American Digitization Project materials are going to be taken off the GBJCI website at uh, the end of this weekend, but as you when watching, you can go directly and there are several ways to access those uh, archives. Um, the rest of the material will be uh, up on our GVJCI website indefinitely. Um, so you have time to go look at them, uh, which is good because, um, I mean, I know just the oral histories alone, there, there are hours of uh, material to listen to. And, uh, but hey, we're still in lockdown, so we've got some time. So go to the website, jci-gardena.org and uh, click on the DOR link. Now we've got a couple of announcements on upcoming events for the GBJCI. There will be a virtual Matsuri uh, to celebrate Girls Day. There's gonna be arts and crafts and music. And that will be on March 6th from two to three o'clock. So 
go to the GVJCI website to register. And then we also have a fundraiser in collaboration with Shinsen Gumi Restaurants um, that will be taking place uh, for about a week from March 13th through March 20th. If you go to the website, uh, if you download a flyer, um, let's see, I don't know if you can see, this is a flyer just like this. And you get that from the website and you take it into any of the Shinsen Gumi restaurants during this uh, time period, March 13th through March 20th. And a uh, percentage of the uh, proceeds will be donated to the GVJCI. And uh, you can do that as many times as you like during that whole time, that whole week. So go uh, and eat at Shinsen Gumi a lot that week. Um, speaking of donations, um, the Day of Remembrance program, of course, is a free program. Uh, but we certainly would appreciate donations if you can afford it. And if you make a donation of at least $20 or more, um, you can get a set of pins. I know I don't, there's this one here, which the Day of Remembrance, which I designed, so I hope you like it. And then there's also the JCI uh, logo. That's in, so that's the two pins that are in the set. If you have trouble seeing this one, well, it's 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 up there. <laughs> so uh, please uh, make a donation. And then um, uh, let me uh, just once again thank the George and Sakai Aratani uh, Community Advancement Research Endowment and the UCLA Asian American Studies Center for their co-sponsorship. And again, um, let's see, once again, I wanna thank Donald Inadomi for his support and all of our community sponsors. If you go to the website, um, there are links to uh, the websites of all of these organizations. So I'd encourage you to go and, and look and see what all of these different groups are involved with and what they're doing. Thanks again to our program manager, Stephanie Maeda, who's back there um, helping to keep things together. Um, thank you to Taylor and Eileen and Michelle, who's also in the background and all of the Day of Remembrance uh, Planning Committee members. Thanks again to our guests, Greg Williams, Jennifer Hill, and Noah Maruyama. And thanks again to all of you for watching today. This is the end of our DOR program. Stay safe and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you.